welcome to the next generation entrepreneurs. How you Speaking doing, man? Excited to have you on here, man. What's the um, goodie, man? It's hey. gonna be an interesting interview because I kind of know all the answers already for most of your. Or do you? Or or do I? Yeah, but it's um, we're good friends. We're here in your uh, beautiful studio as well as Element in the background, so you guys might hear them. Yeah, okay, we're in the recording see. session for my album, uh, only up from here. Exactly. So Chris is working on his album right now. Um, let's get started, man. Man, there's so many things like I want to ask, even though I already kind of know, but mm -hmm. it might be just completely different answer. Uh, let's get a quick background. It's usually what I do with people, uh, where you're from, and, and a little bit of how you grew up and how that affects your music now. I'm from Compton, California. I was born. Uh, I was born in Paramount, but I moved to Compton when I was like in second grade and I lived there up until I graduated and moved to college and then I had to leave my house you know I had to leave I had to move with my family so I grew up in Compton for a majority of my life but I wasn't like I'm not like there's already these, these uh, stigmas of Compton and being from Compton and who you have to be as a person I was a skateboarder I never really left my street and I went to the park sometimes like I knew some some of the homies and cats I was from Capanella Park, Peru, but I was never the guy who was like, you know, I was always the hooper and the skater and the rapper, yeah. you know what I mean? But I wasn't like, I'm not like, I'm a different shade of Compton that nobody really knows about or wants to yeah. accept, you know? I was, was going to talk about that. Compton has a very notorious history background, just the name itself, and the same way that Oakland has its its name. Um, growing up in Compton, is there, what, you have the whole world against you, how did you, do you have the whole world against you, or is that, is that like a fake thing, you know, a lot of people say that it's such a bad place, how did you say you got out of there? Because I have a good mom, my mom, she didn't let me leave the house until I was like 10, 12, she didn't let me, um, she didn't let me leave the block, I actually snuck and skated to the skate park, like on Alameda, uh, they opened the skate park at Wilson's Park, and we were real skaters, bro. We used to hop the fences, like you know how when the park's not open, yeah. and, and like yeah, stuff like that. But my mom, yeah, my mom's the reason why I'm like. But even same in my mind. A, a lot of people would be like, oh, I grew up there. I didn't have the same stuff. I didn't have them all. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what? What, are, what could be their excuses to that answer? You know, um, like. It, I can't even find the proper word for it, but when everything's against you, what would it you know, my last question? When so everything is against you, the most cliche thing to, to say would be to use it as fuel. But what I did was I felt like I deserved it all because I was talented enough to where my, I had an ear and I knew that I had an ear. And sometimes, as a musician, you just have that confidence in your work to where nothing, no, no one can tell you anything, but you'll listen. You feel me? So when they're against you and they say you can't do this and you can't do that, oh, okay, I can't do that. There's other artists and there's other um, actors, there's athletes that made it out of comedy. Exactly, well. but I mean, like I said, there's stigmas like for black people in general. There's ways out of the community. There's roads. There's three roads. There's there's. There's rapping, there's school, and there's drug dealing and stuff like that. Again, all that. Not to get you out of the head, but I mean, like, I want to make Compton like I want people from Compton to be able to reach these things without having to think of a like, how did this person do it? I want there's so much talent in Compton like that people don't know about in impoverished areas in general. That if you just keep your mind set on creating a plan. Like, they don't have plans. You know, like, half the drug dealers in Compton who are talented rappers and have money to pay for everything that they have, I mean, that they need to be a rapper, don't have a plan. They don't have financial plan. They don't have people who taught them how to save money and do all these things. And that's just one example of where planning in the black community or in the impoverished area in general affects how they, like, evolve as a community. So I think people just need to plan, just plan your, <laughs> plan your shit out, you know? Um, let's jump into music. I, I, and, and this is just me being honest, I feel like, I think you said it, or Mike said it, uh, he's like, everyone and their mama wants to be a rapper now. <laughs> yeah. Everyone and their mama wants to be a DJ. Oh, it's How did you DJ, yeah. find your, your lane? How did you know that rapping was, was that I wanted to do, you know? Because I'm not a rapper, bro. I just rap. I'm not a rapper. I'm a musician. 
I've been making music and rapping and recording since I was seven, not seven, the hell, since I was like 12 years old. But how did, how did you find that? Like, what got you to music? What inspired you to do the music thing? Like Church. Like, like a lot of black people. Like, my uncle is a preacher, and he plays the saxophone. My other cousin, his nephew, plays the piano. My other cousin plays the drums, who's his nephew, and his nephew, and my other cousin, plays the guitar, so they have a four set piece of guitar, I'm like band, you know what I mean? And so me being around them, shout out to my cousins, Dono and Dominic, and Darius, and my uncle Ricky, that made me like, see, oh, okay, my cousins were making, play, playing instruments, and making beats, that's how I really became like, into music, because I, I, I have to, I had to see someone do it, for me to believe that I could do it. Mm-hmm. But once I saw someone do it, I felt I could do it. And that's how you found your singing as well, right? I think you remember yeah, yeah. church was how you found Yeah, when I was like as young as nine or ten, we went on like this little church gospel tour. We went on a little tour through Chicago, in the Midwest, like Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, all that. And I had a, I had a solo, and I sang in front of at least 2,000 people or 1,000 people. I don't remember now. It could have been less than that, but... I was a kid, you know what I mean? But I was singing in front of these people and I just was captivating them and I felt like that was just where I was supposed to be, you know? Yeah. So then, as a kid, let's say I'm a kid growing up, anywhere, it doesn't matter, and I'm trying to find my talent, I'm trying to find my passion. Do you have a recipe to find your passion? Do you find it, do, or, or like I said, you know, going back to music, like, when did it, like, when did it stack? It's like, okay, I'm gonna go 100% with this music, I'm gonna put all my effort into it. Um, for me personally, it was when I was 16, and someone emailed me who was an A&R from Atlantic Records, and he basically was flying into L.A., and he, like, uh, you know, came out there and came to my house, talked to me and my mom, and just that whole, like, it wasn't even, like, a big thing. Like, when he pulled up on me, I had, like, a shirt and shorts on, and he was like, yeah, when you meet execs, you don't wear that type of stuff. And I'm 16, 15, you know what I mean? So once I found out about that, that kind of, like, changed my perspective on who I was and the things that I wanted. I, since that moment, I've known that I was going to be on. I just didn't know when, you know? Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. Uh, was that the same exact uh, with when you were working with uh, Warren G? Or was that- nah, this is years after, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what my dad always told me, like, when I fell out with a lot of people that I used to work with and, and when the contracts come around, you know, I'm saying and they don't they don't know that I have a dad who used to work in the music industry you know what I mean he used to work for Russell Simmons and like not like as a big person but you know even though he didn't do a lot of stuff he still was like around the industry to know a lot of things and know what I should do and what I shouldn't do and I had a lawyer you feel me so that kind of like was the reason why I fell out with them but I mean that was more so my dad showing me that if this person wants to work with you, that means that there's more people who want to work with you. Because these people who want to work with you don't want to work with everyone else. Mm-hmm. They don't want to work with everyone. Yeah. That's what I mean. Not everyone else. Everyone. Well, they want to work with specific people. I'm going to bounce on that. How do you reach out to other artists? Uh, I know here in the Bay Area, we have a flourish of upcoming you know, rappers. Uh, we have IM2. We have everyone from you know, HK. Neptu Faro. Neptu Faro. You got g as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as an artist, as an upcoming artist, what advice do you give to kids who are trying to reach out to other artists to collab or, or, or to work on them, you know, it, this, without annoying them? Because I know a lot of times, and people still reach out to you who want beats, who want this, who want that. Yeah. And you tell me, it's like, damn, man, like, these guys are annoying. Where's that balance? How do you do it professionally but still, you know, get their attention without being spammy? Because what's the difference between professionally and doing it as a hobby? What's the main difference? Mm, the hunger? Nah, you can be just passionate about painting if you just do it as a hobby or if you paint or if you sell them. But what's the difference between doing it as a hobby and selling them? Career. The money. Yeah. You got That's the only way you can professionally approach someone is some money. Now, if you're a producer, you feel me, or if you're like someone who like gives gets gives like someone who like like I don't know how to explain it. Like you're a producer basically, but you don't like. You're not a rapper. Basically, if you're not a rapper and you want to work with someone, just reach out to them. If you're not a rapper and you want to work with someone, you're a producer, just send them beats if you want to work with them. But don't send them beats and then 
try to charge them after. Come to them like, oh, I have these beats and I'm selling them for this much. If you want this, then, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if you're a rapper and you know you're not putting as much content out or reaching as large an audience as that artist is, then you have to respect the fact that this is a music business. And they invested money into the fact they have content. And they invest money to go out and perform and get paid for all this stuff is because it's a music business. Like, you can't believe that your stuff is that good to the point where someone just automatically should work with you. Like, have I felt that way before? Yes. And that's what I'm saying. Like, it's not about how good you are. It's about what you can do for someone when it comes down to the yeah, music I business. You know what I mean? Like... It's kind of how I feel with uh, the interviews. Uh, like I told you, there's some people who I thought for sure, I was like, why wouldn't they want to get interviewed? Yeah. They are like, no, I don't want to. And I was yeah. like, it really, at first it hurt me because it was like, why wouldn't you want to get interviewed? Yeah. But it might have not serviced them in the well, but at the same time, I've reached people who are really big mm. who want to get attention at the moment because they're working on something and they want to get exposure, so they do want to get interviewed. So is it about catching them at the right time as well? Yeah, for surely, bro, because I mean, for me, like, this is off the record, but, you know, you're the homie, so, like, I just recently, like, sent some beats to Neff to Pharaoh, and I sent him a beat with a hook, you feel me, and, like, I don't know what made him check his email, I don't know what made him go through all my beats and pick up, he picking beats that I didn't even think he would use, but I sent him, like, 30 beats, and because I did that, and he was just at the studio, like, one song, He's at the studio, he said he was with his big homies, and the, his big homies heard the beat, and was like, if you don't get on that right now, cuz, like, <laughs> but, but it's just the fact of chance. The music business is worth of money and chance. So luck, luck's involved, like, yeah. luck is up with anything, though. Anything. More so, things outside of, like, for, I mean, control. Things are yeah, control. yeah, I'm thinking of industries, like, the music industry is really just, like, strictly based off money and chance. Mm-hmm. If you don't have money, then you gotta put it's based off chance. And if you don't talent? get the chance, then it's based off money. Is talent? talent don't even matter no more, bruh. Talent never really? mattered. Talent never mattered. Because there's some people that argue you have to be talented to, to make it. You know how many talented people there are in the world? Millions, bruh. Billions of talented people that don't even know they're talented. And it's just like a lot of people who aren't talented, but they know. That their they talent the is right somewhere people. else. They're talented, but they're not talented in music. They're talented in speaking to people. They're talented in styling themselves. They're styling, you know what I mean? Like you don't have to have talent in music to be successful as a musician in the industry now. It's crazy. In the industry now. Well, not a musician, an artist. I would say an artist because yeah. you gotta talent. You gotta be talented to be a musician. That's the difference. You gotta understand music. You know? Definitely, definitely. Um, we're gonna stay on the topic about reaching out. Uh, tell me a little bit about working with Warren G and how that happened. A lot of people who are in the hip hop industry would know that such a big name like that. Yeah. Uh, you tell me the story because I know it, but you know, um, listeners. Yeah, I got you. Um, shout out to my big homie F- Fleeta. He's like, you know, one of like my biggest inspirations as far as like, you know, when I first started to, you know, smoke weed and all of that. He was one of my OGs. Put me on. Show me what good weed was. What was bad weed? You know what I mean? And basically, I was just at my good homie, like, Mike. Shout out to my homie, Mike. I was at his house, and he was having a family function, but I was so dedicated to music at a young age that I was shooting a video. I was like, oh, we can have all those people over there for sure. We're going to come over there, and we're going to shoot CNG. We had a song called CNG with me, my homie Bremen, and my homie J-Rod. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, you, you know, you know. They don't know it, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we were shooting that video, and then I noticed this dude's, like, kind of looking at in our direction, and just drinking his beer, and looking, and just listening, he's like, oh, you did this? I'm like, yeah, this is my stuff, this is my music, and then coincidentally, my friend Mike, his mom went to middle school with Warren G, mm-hmm. and went to, went to middle school with, not Warren G, if, if not specifically Warren G, with Fleeta, and that's why Fleeta, uh, and Fleeta knew Warren G, like, was his homie, like, used to go to all the studio sessions with him, like, when they were younger, kind of like how, like, not, not Simon because he doesn't make beats, but you know how Simon's always with me? It's like, that's how him and Warren G kind of were. Like, they would be, like, he would turn yeah, up with together, them. Yeah, yeah he, and, like, and it wasn't that big a deal because he knew everybody. He knew Dre, all those cats, you feel me? Because he grew up with them. He knew Snoop. He knew all those cats. And he took, my, he took me to a session basically one time, and I met Warren. 
and then uh, I saw he had uh, that was a crazy experience for me because he had so many like um, he just had like a, a jam session and it was I never knew that I never been to a big studio before or worked in a big studio because I had been to a big studio but I never worked in it a studio that big yeah but and then the next time I came he just uh, we just started working on music bro we probably have like 40 songs but we worked all summer long 2012 the summer of 2012 going into our freshman year of Santa of State we worked every single night I was huh. yes I was but once I left to Frisco I, I never I never seen him again yeah, because I know you actually had a chance to record with some big names. The people who are big now, which is funny enough. Was, yeah. Uh, let me see if I get it right. Was, was T-Fly one of them or no? No, Tired Dolla Sign, Casey Veggies, Dom Kennedy. Yeah. Um, this producer named Mars. I met all these cats. Like I met Mars again. I don't know if he remembers when I met him when I was one. Mm-hmm. But I was you really, really young. young right? I was really young, yeah. yeah. He probably remembers this. He might remember the session if I... There was a session... It was me, Dom Kennedy, Ty Dolla Sign, and it was in Hollywood at, uh, I think, Paramount Studios. I'm not sure, but I was 16, and that was, like, my first big smoke session, and, like, there was so many blunts going around. Just smoking. <laughs> I'm just, like, rapping and shit, just smoking. I was hella quiet, but I'm getting my part together, going around and around and around. What? And then I just fucking knocked out, bro. I got too loaded. I couldn't do nothing. I was so embarrassed, bro. Like, Ty Osa was there. Don Kenny was there. But yeah, I met all those people through Warren. What happened to that music? Where is it? I don't know. Maybe we might hear it one day. One of these days. When I I actually, like, make it on my own, he might just put him out. Definitely. definitely. One of the things I I wanted to talk about is uh, when you, I think when we first met, I asked you what genre of music you did, and the word you said was, "I'm not, I'm not gonna be put in a box. I'm a genre experimentalist." Yes. What does that mean to be a genre, genre experimentalist? Is uh, it's an ism, bro. Like experimentalism, you know what that is. Mm-hmm. Now, genre is a way of understanding music and characteristics yeah. and grooves and textures and BPM. Now, if you in, if you're at experimentalist like to genre, you don't think within the binds or the confines of this genre works this way and this genre works that way, because like think about a dance hall song or Beanie Man, his songs all have those, you know what I mean? That's a different groove. But for me personally, you don't ever really hear 808s. In those type of songs, 808s, like the songs you hear in Gucci Man and stuff like that. Those are the, the low sub you hear in Amigos. You don't hear that. For my new album, I'm taking I'm taking the Beanie Man, reggaeton, dancehall groove, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the characteristics of it and adding 808s to it, adding hip-hop claps to it, you know what I mean? Synthesizers to it in just a completely different way than it's been done, you know what I mean? It's... Because I know you even made a song in Spanish, um, mm-hmm. which is one of my favorite songs that you make. So for people who are in business or people who are who are doing music, is it to not be afraid of trying something new, not being afraid of trying I mean, it's just knowing that it ain't all going to work and then understanding that I'm different than everyone. So, like, it's hard for me to tell people, like, that what to do because when I try some shit, it works musically. Yeah. Like, whenever I try to do anything musically... It works. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I don't really know how to explain it for well, like... Let me put it like this. I know a lot of times when I go to the studio with you, uh, though people are like, oh yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go for that Drake sound, or I'm mm-hmm. trying to sound like Kanye, I'm trying to... Yeah. And then you, you have your own sound, so how, how would a musician find their own sound? Or how do you find, or have you found your own sound yet? Yeah, I found my sound like four years ago. Mm-hmm. And you know, inspiration, that's how you find your sound, inspiration. I would just say this, bruh. Nothing is new under the sun. So Kanye West, Drake, they all made their own style, the styles that they took, and you know, that's why Drake's so popular. His songs now, because he uses old lines that people don't know about, except the people who do know, yeah. and they're like, ah, you know what I mean? They call him out, and or they like it, or they like love it even more. Or like Jay Z, he did the same thing. He used Biggie's lyrics over in other songs. Like full on verses, bro. I know Jake. I think Jake Cole does it a lot too. Jake Cole samples a lot of Ziggy's uh, verses. Yeah, so it's just like I think the only way you can really make your own sound is 
understand what you like and then understanding your music and characteristics. Yeah. Once you understand music and characteristics, you'll surpass everyone. That's why I always tell everyone. Think of music and characteristics and you'll just, you will soar past any producer you know. Because they're all trying to make, oh, I want to make a Ty Dolla Sign beat. What makes a Ty Dolla Sign beat? Well, yeah, let's get into that. I know a lot of people don't even know what an 808 is, what a snare is. Yeah. Or better yet, what instrument creates that. Uh, yeah. You were lucky enough to play with instruments. How have playing instruments when you're younger affected you now as a producer? And how did, you know, let's, well, maybe we'll get into the little, uh, the Black Eyed Peas thing after, but let's talk about the instruments first. Because I know, I was, I was listening to an interview where, uh, I think it was DJ Mustard, and he's like, yeah, my uncle tried me playing the piano, and I was like, man, I don't want to do that gay shit. And yeah. he's like, that's one of my biggest regrets I ever have now, is yeah. not learning to play the piano yeah. when I was younger. Yeah. So. I mean, it's, it's, it's statistically proven that kids who learn to play instruments learn things quicker. Really? Yeah, bro. Oh. Like, they learn languages faster. They learn, like, why do you think, like, Asian parents always have their kids playing the piano or violin or something? It's not always, not always, okay? That's, that's an overgeneralization, but you know what I mean? I know what you mean? Those type of things help them with their studies and other things. So I feel like me playing instruments made me exercise my mind in a way that other kids didn't exercise their mind. But I wasn't taught, like, you can through play a the, book. You can play the guitar. Yeah. You can play the piano. Yeah. You can play drums. Yeah. What play else? bass guitar. Yeah, what else is there? I mean, like, but you learned this on your own, you said, because I remember you. Basically, man, because I tried to take lessons and they didn't want to move fast enough. So I told my dad I wasn't going no more. And I just used the book he bought for me and taught myself and then learned songs that I like. And then... Well, how about the story when you said um, you were, like, in a band? Yeah, I was in a band. Uh, we were called Mitchell's Frustration because my band, uh, my band teacher's name was Mr. Mitchell, who influenced me to be a musician, like one of my top five inspirations as far as life influencers. He influenced me to, uh, like he was, he made, he let us practice there during lunch and re he let us do it in pr lunch and recess, and then we performed for like the whole school multiple times, and then um, what was a man. Oh yeah, so basically like if someone would show up late to practice, I would just use the instrument and move like a microphone down so I could like use the instrument and, and sing. I would play the bass. If some, the bass player didn't come, I'd play the bass until he came. If the guitarist didn't come, I'd play the guitar. If the drummer didn't come, I'd play the drums, you know? And that's how you started learning all these things. And I had a friend, his name was Giovanni, and he was like a big influence in me learning guitar because he was so good. He was already 6'1 in 8th grade, so his hands were hell big, and he could play all this Jimi Hendrix, all this, he was the lead guitarist, and I would play rhythm if the rhythm guitar just didn't come, because Gio was always with, with me when it came to music, he would be there, and so he would just be killing it, and I'd be like, wow, how'd you learn that, and he'd be like, here, bro, and he would show me exactly how he learned it, and I would play it slower, and then eventually I started to place my own, you know what I mean? That was the difference between me and other kids was that I learned shit so I could play my own shit. Well, yeah, let me let me get into that. How big of an importance, and we talked about it on the part right here, um, is hanging around the people you're with affects their music and affects who they are as a person. I mean, it's it's all about your vibe, bruh. Vibes is everything to me, bro. That's why sometimes I have to just, no matter where I'm at, I learned this from my, my past relationship. You have to meditate bruh like you have to like sometimes i just have to act nowhere i'm it doesn't matter where i'm at i can just close my eyes and just i have to release whatever my mind is on and that's why i'm all about vibes because if i don't like someone's vibe i'll let them know definitely like i was in I've seen it. I've, I've yeah <laughs> yeah like, i'll let people know like hey bruh is it good like what's up like if you know me you've probably been around me when i've asked someone like or I had to press someone like, hey, bro, like, you acting hella weird. Like, you don't act like that around me. Like, But I'm, I'm talking in the sense of being around other musicians, hanging around with other rappers, hanging out with other producers. How does that affect you? Affect me or affect an artist? An artist. Uh, I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're like me, or then you, you, you soak a lot of shit in. So, I mean, like, if you're around a lot of people that do a certain sound, you're going to want to start doing that sound. If you like it, if you're around a lot of people who are not 
liking something. That's the difference. Me and that, I just because someone else doesn't like some shit doesn't mean I'm not gonna like it. Yeah. Like in my album, there's a lot of shit. Simon, you don't listen to that type of music. You don't like rock music like that. You know what I mean? But that doesn't mean it's not good or I'm gonna stop doing it. You know what I mean? Perfect follow up for the next question. My parents sometimes, even with the interviews, and I don't know how they're gonna take this, but sometimes they're like, "Why are you doing that?" Yeah. Yeah. That's, that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, in same in same sense with you, your parents were very supportive of your music. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have other people, or if, if we do have people that are against it, how did you take that, and how do you handle it? I feel like I never had nobody who told me I couldn't do it because once you see what I could do then they would be like, oh, yeah, you can do it. Mm-hmm. But what I did have is doubters to, to say I wouldn't be as big or I wouldn't be where I'm going to be at. Like, like you know, no offense to anyone, but like how, you know, Warren G back in the day, like if he would have signed me, I probably would have, I'd probably be as big as Travis Scott. You know what I mean? Or, you know, I'm the Atlantic dude. The You know what I'm saying? Like those A&Rs. That's how I feel people overlooked me. Because I wasn't a game maker and because I didn't do these things and I didn't do that, people overlooked me. And people do that. And, and what was your question again? Like, I know, I had that. I had the overlook. Like you were saying. If, if when people look, they're like, for people who don't support you. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm like, saying. Oh, people don't even... support me. It's not that they don't support me, they overlook me. So they'll look at me and be like, wow, he's tight. And then be on to the next shit. Well, how about the kids who want to pursue the rapping? They want to and people who are not supporting them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. You just gotta not give one fuck at all. You just gotta not care, bro. I know people who are not good, bro. But they have shows all the time. And they pursuing their career. And I've seen it. And and we'll be backstage and we're like, how are these guys performing? And I don't know how they do it, but they're, they're, they're just pushing so hard. You just gotta have... You just gotta believe your shit is good at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Like, you gotta make music. I, my dad always told me a great musician can make music for other people. And I'm glad that he told me that because that made me make music differently. He doesn't even know that. But a great musician can also make music for himself, too, and make music for himself that other people like. Yeah. Those are the best. Those are the Kanye Wests. Those are the Timberlands and the, and the Pharrells. Like, oh, this is your sound? Nah, my sound's this. And you love it. You know what I mean? Like, so... Yes. Well, and, and one question I did want to get into it. Uh, a lot of my friends are in relationships, were in relationships. How did, or like you were in a relationship during most of music when I met you? Yeah. How did that affect your music? And if the partner doesn't want to support the partner's dream, what do you recommend? I mean, if you really about music from day one, you're going to let people know, like, you'll never be more of the music to me. And it sucks, you know what I'm saying? Because I love music so much more than I love life. Like, if I could if I could live in music for eternity, I would. I wouldn't need anyone. I wouldn't, bro. Because music is like my lover, my hater, my friend. It's like my doubter. It's, it's everything. It's not like... It's, music is more than... Music. It's a spirit, yeah. bro. It's like, if I had no music, I'd be lifeless. So for me, like personally, my relationships, anyone that I get involved with, I always let them know, like, music is my priority. I would never let them know music. You'll never be bigger than music, but music is my priority. And for me specifically, it it has caused problems because I don't make time for people. I don't do a lot of stuff like that I should do because I'm so in the studio and I'm so involved in music that it's just hard. Well, we're talking about that. It's not a bad thing though. Like if if I'm all the time editing my videos and doing interviews, I'm doing what I love. Like sure, people. It's just a bad thing when you love someone, when you love them really hard, and it just doesn't work. So I think there is a balance eventually. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, we're so young, bro. We barely can balance our shit. It's funny seeing this, like more. I know, bro. Later on, you're gonna be like, "What? I said that." Like, <laughs> hopefully, I feel a little bit the same way. Or honestly, hopefully, my ideas are 180. Who yeah, cares? Yeah, well, well, we never know. Uh, so let's start wrapping up the interview. There's a couple questions that I always ask towards the end. Uh, one of them is, to you, what is what does the definition of success mean to Chris? I mean, I just feel like sometimes my goals are hella cliche, but I just want to be immortal, bro. I know that sounds hella selfish, but 
I just want to be immortal, and even if my name isn't remembered, I want my legacies to be remembered, like, the strategies that I'm going to use for the hood, and I'm going to use for music, and the way I'm going to change the whole game, because I'm about to just go international, so, I mean, success to me is, at the end of the day, sitting back and feeling like my time didn't go to waste. Mm -hmm. If I'm in my deathbed, and I feel like I wasted my time doing something, then I feel like I was unsuccessful. But time is the most important thing to me before music, because without time, I, there's no music. You know what I mean? Well, we talked about it. Like we're, we're eventually gonna die. So exactly, bro. Time. Exactly. So I just want to make sure, like, people know me, not for me, but for the things that I'm gonna leave by. So. And is there a philosophy or a moral that you live by every single day? Mm. Man, just stay sane, bro. Just stay sane, bro. Because even I teach a totter on the deep end. Nobody knows that. Mm -hmm. But just stay sane, bro. Like, so just my grandma told me on her deathbed, and I know I failed her sometimes, but it's an ongoing battle. And I know because I haven't lived by this my whole, like, I haven't lived by this completely as I should. But she told me, man, on her deathbed, she said, if it feel like you shouldn't do it, don't do it. Okay. If you feel like you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, don't do it. Just don't do it. Just yeah. don't. And just stay sane, man. That's, That's it. Right. That's a good advice. Well, I've been doing this religiously for the past, and the viewers probably know by now. I, I always give a present. To my, uh, oh what? Uh, is it weed? It was no, it's not weed. Uh, it was gonna be the beanie. Oh, okay. But I don't have the beanie. But I was gonna bring a, a second present, anyways. Uh, got this uh, really big calendar for the studio. Uh, so hey, element. <laughs> oh. Uh, stay on track of things. It might uh, help out a lot. You're a beast, bro. And, uh, I love what, you, bro. What I want to start incorporating. Probably the first one uh, is asking a question to the viewers, and they can answer. So you can use this as feedback for your stuff in the future. Any questions that you would want, uh, you know, knowledge on from entrepreneurs, musicians, fitness people. These are all the people that you watch the show. What what would you want to ask them? How do you solidify your brand? How do you solidify your brand? Yeah. How do you do it? Learn it. Well. Let's uh, see whenever this video drops. Hopefully, people will start asking questions. Thank you for it. I love you, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you.